Hi again. William Schnell, page 22 of 30 Years of Watched Our Slave, talking about his uh, zeal in the early to mid-20s when the Millions campaign was going strong. And now the subhead is, With feigned words making merchandise. No one can read the history and literature of the Watched Our Society without thinking of Peter's words. Through covetousness, they shall with feigned words make merchandise of you. That's 2 Peter 2.3. Time and again they cited words of scripture, tore them out of their setting, and misapplied them to suit their own purpose. And they did this with the eventual goal of selling books to obtain contributions of money to build up a worldwide watchtower organization. This strategy proved so successful that it has been constantly used to this day. The book is published in 1956. Of course, they're no longer a publishing empire, are they? see it in these early moves and then as it appears and reappears throughout the history of the Watchtower movement. From the beginning, this trick was used to get the people to buy and read Watchtower published books and booklets. These writings always contained a kernel of truth, particularly at the beginning, as baked. But the whole was so weighted down and intertwined with organizational jargon as to set the befuddled reader's head in a whirl. Before the unwary victim realized it, he had surrendered all individualism, abandoned all personal thinking, and given up all private initiative. All this was designed to put the one who listened to these words into a position where he would read only the society's books, booklets, and magazines. After he had acquired a taste for that kind of fare, the one so brainwashed was not only led into believing this watched our literature, but in his new position as kingdom publisher, he was compelled to peddle this literature from door to door as the truth of the gospel. He observed watched our set and inspired hours and worked submissively to attain a book placement quota. He w could be compelled against his wishes and inclinations to go into certain territories, place certain books, and report the time spent in doing so. Can you think of a clearer example of men being made merchandise through the use of feigned words. Here is a striking example of how the society pounced upon scripture which might serve its purpose. Everywhere there was unrest and uncertainty following World War I. What better passage of scripture could they find for their purpose than Matthew 24? This passage, so they contended, referred definitely and specifically to the times at hand. Of course, in making this claim, they conveniently overlooked that there had repeatedly been wars and rumors of wars, as well as wars which might have been called world wars. That was a world-shaking war when the Mohammedans knocked at the gates of France after having overrun Africa and Asia and involved the whole of Europe, and its outcome was far more important and decisive to Western civilization than that of World War I. When the Huns, who were Asiatics and Eastern Europeans and some Levantine, overran Europe, they were finally met by the flower of Europe's armies and defeated. That too was a world war, drawing all nations into its vortex from far Cathay to the gates of Hercules. And the outcome of that war also was far more decisive than was World War I. Thus, the rumors of war and nation rising against nation, as it occurred in 1914, was not unique to that age. It had occurred before. Besides, our Lord in the prophecy of Matthew 24 was speaking of something quite different. He was answering questions of his disciples put in this way. And Jesus went out from the temple and was going on his way. And his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. But he answered unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Our Lord noted how his disciples were still tied to the buildings, the temple, and the city of Jerusalem, and how much they thought of these things. Little as yet did they comprehend the great change in relationship coming their way, when they would no longer worship in buildings made with hands, in the sense that it had been done in this temple and in this city. All of this, he prophesied, would come to an end amidst horrible conditions of tribulation, such as the world had never before seen. Naturally, the disciples wanted to know when these things would transpire, and therefore, as they sat on the Mount of the Olives, 
the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? All three parts of the question concerned a specific situation, and Jesus' answer applied to that particular situation. Nowhere is there here evidence that this passage has reference to a time in which one specific world war would release a chain reaction, such as the Watchtower read into the events which followed the war of 1914 to 18. Why then should the society use this passage? Well, it served their purpose by misusing this scripture and tying it in with the prevalent unrest following World War I. The Watchtower Society created a psychological backdrop to give apparent deep meaning to its advertising campaign. All this was brought to a climax with the statement of the 14th verse, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, and then the end shall come. This gave prophetic color and completely justified its book-selling campaign. The clever superimposition of prophecy over the world background following the war was a masterstroke, if there ever was one. It followed a pattern which the Watchtower Society has used ever since with great cunning, consummate skill, and great financial and organizational success. This is the pivot upon which revolves the entire strategy of its worldwide proselyting campaign. Then he goes on to the natural follow-up, which was the 1922, advertise, advertise, advertise the king and his kingdom. And the key word there, of course, is not kingdom, but advertise. Rutherford was caught in the first wave of the of of the growth of advertising as a, a as a consumer device, and sure, the Watchtower did that for generations better than anybody in the religious world. However, it's not kingdom preaching they were doing. The kingdom at this point is tied to eighteen seventy eight and nineteen fourteen, and the end was to come by about nineteen twenty five. That was the belief in those days. Uh, I'll put in a link to Carl Olaf Johnson and Rudd Persson's analysis of this idea of a composite sign of the last days that took off with this millions campaign in 1919-1920. Johnson and Persson's Sign of the Last Days, and I'll also put a link to the Kingdom playlist, which has now got quite a few videos on it. Check it out. See you soon.